Well, hello and welcome to another movie review from MBE. Today we are going to be talking about 2002's David Fincher's Panic Room, John. Um, before we get into it, before I pass it over to you to guide us through this experience, I actually did a review on this on our blog two years ago. I've went back and read it just to see if I felt the same way about the film because I've not seen it in two years. Yes. And uh, yeah, I, I agree with myself most of the time. So, um, But <laughs> listen, we'll just kick on with it anyway. It's uh, obviously Jodie Foster's starring in this, but there is a whole host of other stars and a very small cast. Yeah, it's a very, very small cast. Even David Fincher actually wanted to take everything that he'd done with Fight Club, which came out prior to this, I believe this was the release straight after Fight Club. Take all of the things he did in that movie and completely throw them in the bin and do the complete opposite in this movie. So yeah. I think he shot in 125 or 29 different locations for Fight Club. Maybe wrong. If someone out there knows the actual number, then they can correct me. And so he didn't want to go through all that crap again. So he shot in one location. Well, primarily one location in this film. Yeah. As you did see, many, many <coughs> cast members, including Jared Leto yeah. in Fight Club, really constricted it down. I think there was only six cast members or something, if you include the... Well, maybe eight if you include the police officers. Yeah. Nine if you include that little fat, lazy neighbour who wasn't listening to the SOS light signals. So, yeah, very interesting concept that you went for in this movie. Uh, Stephen, what did you make about the intro, though? Because obviously that intro was very unique as well. I don't think I've seen anything like that done in a movie prior to this or after. Also with the credits oh, yeah, snapping yeah, round yeah. the buildings and stuff like that and moving across the street. Really strange. I don't know why it was yeah. there. It was never really explained. I no. think it was just a cool little, this is what we can do with names yeah. now in the, the credits scene. I think you can do that in iMovie now, John. But you can, you're yeah. absolutely right. I it forgot about that actually. You know, um, as I said, I've not seen the film in two years, but... I do remember those opening credits and what the point of them was because it was very um, sort of short in landscape yeah. showing you across the city of New York. Maybe then, just to show that it is in New York <laughs> yeah, city. Yeah. yeah, well, I took their word for it anyway. But then, you know, what you actually get in the film is I don't think they leave the house till the very end, I think. that's Or, or maybe at the very beginning and the very end they're in Central Park on a bench, I think. Yeah. I recall, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's, it's all set in the one area. Um, it's a very large townhouse, so you've Absolutely got plenty gigantic. of room to... Yeah, I wouldn't mind staying there myself. It's, um, I actually did say in uh, the review I did, it's, um, the actual surroundings they're in, it's not like a creepy old house or anything like that. It's, um, it's obviously a very old Victorian, I don't know if that's the right time period or not, John. Rusty, but probably very, ge uh, Georgian. Maybe, but um, it's just, you know, it's, it's obviously uh, from a, a different period in time anyway, you know, it's, it's it's a very old house, but there's nothing creepy about it, it's oh. a very classy house, I felt. Steen, I'd love that house, uh, and obviously the daughter's complaining about the number of stairs, there's too many stairs in this house, I think that was deliberate again, even though he wanted to yeah. constrict this into one setting, there's numerous levels and rooms and landscapes to play about with, it gives... Him, ample opportunity to weave the camera around, which he does to really startling effect in this movie. I'm sure we'll get into that yeah. in a few moments. But Stephen, obviously the introduction to this movie, it does it beautifully sets the tone of what's happening with Meg and her daughter, Sarah. She's yeah. split up. <clears throat> it's revealed just matter of a fact that the husband, I think it's Stephen Altman. Yeah. I may be wrong. Yeah, you're right. He's a right. pharmaceutical kingpin, essentially. He's a multi-millionaire, yeah. maybe billionaire, I don't know. Lord knows he could be if she can afford that house for her and just her daughter. And it also they're separated. It's been a very unharmonious split. She's out looking for a new house. She's a new this, life, ho yeah. this house has come up onto the market. It's a one in a million house. As you did say, it's like George and Edwardian, numerous levels. It's got a back garden, I think, and everything, which is really unusual for New York. I think it's the Upper West Side Village or whatever the hell they call it. I always think of Greenwich Village and that's in London. I don't know why. <laughs> Bob Dylan territory. I think he hung around these. This was his haunt back in the day in the 60s. So it's a really good opportunity. She's not keen though. She doesn't really want to spend the money. I think she's still got a, a degree of separation anxiety from yeah. her old life. She's come to terms with it. You see her crying later on yeah. when they move in. Uh, over a glass of wine in the bath, so yeah, some bath, that, yeah. it really is some bath. It's some house. It's just yeah. a shame they don't get to enjoy it for very long, Stephen. But how did you make of Fincher the way that he set the characters up early on through this? <clears throat> obviously, looking through this new house and being shown around by an estate agent, just did a little embellishing of the yeah. characters and tidbits. Well, well, yeah. Obviously, Sarah mucking around with the lift as well. 
showing that she knows that how clever, to operate yeah. it. That yeah. was needed yeah. for later uh, on. It was very interesting. Obviously, Kristen Stewart is, is playing the, the daughter Sarah John. Mm-hmm. Very young, maybe about 12 at the time or something like that. 1990, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. oh, well, there they are. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's set up nice. Um, I think it's set up in a way that, um, you know, Jodie Foster's character is. I don't want to say vulnerable. Um, well, she I is. think in the situation she's vulnerable, but I think as a, a person and her character, normally she's probably a, a quite a focused and confident person, but I think she's just in a bad place when we enter into her life, if yeah. you like, you know. And it, it's set up nicely. It doesn't really sort of linger on too much and it sort of bog down the you know where we're going with this. It's really just a nice introduction. It's probably... I don't, I don't even think I was going to say I don't think it's five minutes long no. anyway it's just enough time because we really just want to get into this thriller right away and they, do and, that. And they don't really waste a lot of time because you said this as well John it's all set over the one night so yeah. um, maybe three hours uh, yeah it's, it's not like even 2 a whole night to yeah. 5 a.m. yeah it's a really unique concept. Yeah. And obviously, the, it does nick into little <coughs> details, though. It obviously, when they do move in, and the, the night they've moved in, the burglars come in. Yep. But she uh, obviously puts... I don't want like to say puts, because 12 years old is maybe a little old for putting to bed, but she's a sort of fragile child. We'll get into that as well. She's a bit of a nuisance, a, a hindrance in parts <laughs> of this movie, annoyingly so. Yeah. But she obviously puts her to bed. And you see little glimpses of the diabetic medicine in the fridge. Yeah. yeah. Little things like that, just if you're a curious individual with a good peripheral vision and an eye for detail, you will spot these little things, messages he's sending you early on in this movie. She has a condition, yeah. so when they get locked in the panic room, if you have caught it, you will know there's going to be trouble ahead for these characters. I just love that, I love the eyes for detail, that's what I love about knowing and whatnot. The cerebral yeah. storytelling, yeah. little details, someone like me, it's a deep shit, I like honing in little things like that. Obviously the Bugglers do come in though, uh, and it's almost Ant Man esque looking back now. But obviously, I didn't think that at the time when I first no. seen it because Ant Man wasn't out. But the way they're climbing up in the building and utilising, obviously, a foreman, not aforementioned, previous knowledge of this layout because one of the guys has good inside information about yeah. this house. That was a really nice, again, the way you utilise the camera, the way they infiltrate the building. They obviously, um, Burnham, played by. Uh, Forest Whitaker, yeah, Forrest yeah. yeah. He is startled by the fact that there's inhabitants in this house. He, they're not supposed to be here. Uh, and that really does set the tone as well for what's to come. These guys, right away, are put in the back step. They don't want to be in a house with other people. Certainly not no. burn them anyway. He doesn't want to kill anybody. So they are uncomfortable. And, and then obviously we as the audience are uncomfortable it's watching funny, these guys it? stepping yeah, around it, at it, night. It's funny how it's set up because you're right. You know, they don't want a be in this scenario and clearly the mother and daughter don't want to be in this nobody wants to be in this house at this point in time you know it's just unfortunate and you're right you know um, where obviously the the treasure is placed in the house as well is is very clever because you're going to get that sort of stalemate at some point especially when the mother and daughter end up in the panic room but um, what I liked about the the three guys as well um, you had Junior, Rao and Burnham they're all different types of people, and you're yeah. right. Forrest Whitaker's um, character is like a big gentle giant to an extent, you know. Um, he doesn't. He, he basically, I think they all just want in and out as quickly as possible. Yeah. But um, patience wears thin, obviously, with some of the characters, and um, you know the the junior character. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, what, what was the one? That's yeah, Junior. K- Jared that one that's, no, the, well, it's Raoul then. Raoul, yeah. The one with the mask on. Um, he's a God, he he's a strange one. character, I mean, you know, as the, as the film progresses, you know, he's a very mysterious chap at the very beginning, but it's a nice setup because you're and not And the way getting... he comes in, Stephen, via the door. Yeah. He's not part of the, well, not originally anyway, I think he comes to the door. He does, yeah. And he introduces him in, and Burnham's like, who the hell is this? Yeah. Some cabbie, I know, or something yeah. like that anyway. But yeah, you're right, it was really interesting the way the concept of this safe room and them wanting into it, them being in it, it did almost produce a sort of chess type thing where they have to plan their moves out wisely. Yeah. Really, I, I says in the notes, ex- expert level of building tension and obviously the score and all of that and the shots you did hit upon it in your review as well, Stephen, the darkness in this, yeah. obviously hit this house, the deliberate choice of muted colour palette and whatnot yeah. just lends to a sense of uneasiness. It's not spooky though, but it is no. uneasy. Also, you do have that moment where she realises that there is 
people in the house and she's rushing around trying to get her daughter. It's a race against you know, there's time. A, there's a good shot in there, John, as well, yeah. where she's lying down and you see the silhouette. I think it's Burnham. It is, yeah. yeah in the background, it's the way the camera just pans around. I think it actually rotates, doesn't it? Yeah. It's just a, a, a quite an eerie sort of shot that Fincher does there. And, he looks uh, creepy as hell as well yeah, at that point. I think it's just because of his towering stature, you know, and, and because you're focused on her and you just see his blur sort of shadow, you know, in the background. I think it's the way it's lit as well. It's kind of a, like a grey-blue yeah. sort of behind him, as I recall. Um, it's just a great shot. It's something, you know, you always get that in a good film um, where you, you remember a certain shot. That's certainly the shot that I remember. And also it plays into that dark fear in most humans that if you're in a room sleeping at night, there's something in the house or the room stalking you. In this case, it's actually there. She's yeah. not aware of it. But that really was, that was creepy as hell, Stephen, when the, obviously they're in the elevator. And that great cut scene with also Junior played by Jared Leto trying to get into the elevator. You can see him outside, you can see them inside. Yeah. That four I keep wanting to say aforementioned, I don't know why I'm obsessed with this word tonight. That prior knowledge from Sarah of utilising the elevator, lift, whatever you want to call it, in yeah. the mo- in the intro of the movie comes in handy because she then tells her mother, look, this is how you do it, you get it, you change direction here. It's a rush to the safe room and then that sets up that real I want to say first two acts of a movie where they're stuck in there and they're trying to manoeuvre out to get things in there or also what you get in there and yeah. it's just perfectly built the whole as, intro to this know, movie and, and obviously try, try to wake up her daughter as well with the, the glass of water or the bottle of water you know just to get her sort of focused you know, and, deep sleeper. and um, it's that race as well there's a race to the room isn't there mm-hmm. you know and um, unfortunately one of them gets their hand caught in the, the door um, <laughs> there is elements of humour in this film we've got to be honest John there's um, if you've got that kind of wicked sense of humour, you will get a kick out of some oh, yeah. of the things in this. That, you know, like ears getting burnt and stuff like that, or faces getting burnt. But um, yeah, it's it's just a good setup. This is this is obviously the, this is where we're getting to in the film now. You know where what's going to happen next? They don't want it out, and they want in. You know, there's, how are they going to work this out? They're going to try and negotiate it. You know, and of course, Steve, the technical mastery in that scene as well. When the burglars do come into the house, the first moment we see the camera weaving through keyholes and down the yeah. staircase, it's just incredible. Yeah. One of the first times I think I've seen that done. It may be the first time yeah, I've seen it done. Really I know well Fincher done. Yeah. has previous for being sort of pioneering with his camera techniques and the way he likes things shot, but that was. A magnificent scene, really. We've seen it copied time and again. Also, yeah. I think it's Man of War or something, or Lord of War, Nick Cage. A movie that Jared Leto, I think, was also involved in, if I'm not wrong. So there's five degrees of separation of yeah. Jared Leto in this movie and all the things interconnected. They try to copy it with that introduction scene with the bullet going through the manufacturing process straight into a terrorist gun. Totalitarian terrorist. <laughs> Feeling like Steve Coogan here. So, yeah, I mean, that was really cool. Never really managed to excel at doing that technique after this, though. And as you did say as well, it becomes boring. They start yeah. using it too much throughout this movie. But, Stephen, obviously, the dynamic I've says here, you touched upon it there as well, of these three robbers. They, they're working in tandem early on in the movie, but that facade drops very quickly. Yeah. They are distinctly different personalities. They've all got their unique motivations. Yeah. They want the same thing but they're motivated differently. Burnham, it's established by uh, Junior. I think he's in a bit of trouble financially. He's a big gentle giant. He has helped build these safe rooms yeah, to keep into, people yeah. like him out. Yeah. Uh, so that is another layer of complexity in there. He knows how to get in, but he knows he can't get in, so it's very complicated. But these guys start bickering amongst each other very, very early on in the movie. There's, there is humour in here, you're right. Yeah. Some of the interactions between these characters. I have got a couple of quotes. Hey, this is what I do. If some idiot with a sledgehammer could break in, do you think I'd really still have a job? Something along those lines anyway. Uh, and then obviously, um, I think they're trying to hit the sledgehammer up through the bottom of the safe room. They're creating an almighty racket. Yep. Burnham goes out to get a gas canister. He realises there's a flaw in yeah. a, perhaps a design he can utilise. When he starts hitting into the wall, I think it's Junior says to him, can you make any more noise? They're, they're trying to sleep over there. It's like, are you kidding me? Just yeah. the interactions yeah. between these characters. What was your thoughts on these three characters when you first seen this movie? All distinctly different. I know you did touch upon it previously, but just the dynamic. Yeah. These are not the type of people you would expect to see work together. It's very I, strange yeah, bedfellows. I mean, uh, they all come in as equals, John, but it's very, um, it's, it's very quickly established who is the sort of hierarchy 
and all this, and it's not the one you would think in Jared Leto. He actually becomes the middleman between obviously Burnham I'm the and leader. Ryle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, you are. Yes, yes. Uh, but uh, yeah. yes, exactly what I thought. Thorin, uh, Star Lord. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's exactly like that, you know. And um, it's it's just it's is the way they're set up, you know. Obviously, when they come in, as I said, you know, they're equals. Um, but as things don't go according to plan because the plan was to get in and out that's obviously went out the window now the bickering starts because they've not got the sort of um, the, 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 well two of them don't know each other for a start so they can't work as a team because they don't trust the, the trust thing in there as well Is that he's an issue? wearing a mask yeah he's wearing a mask he won't reveal his it's face a barrier right away. I, but once he takes it off you can understand why he wears a mask yeah, exactly same. He's, he's, he hair. looks like um, you know the, the presenter in Tales from the Crypt um, it looks a bit like that with the straggly hair. But, it's a um, rat. Yeah. <laughs> he's but, a good actor, though. Yeah, he I mean, he's menacing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a good setup, John. And it's, it's this is where Burnham sort of shines because he's got to try and work out a way of, um, you know, able to put some kind of pressure, um, you know, on that door to, to get it opened. You know, whether that be, you know, through, you know, pressure through gas or you know, the electrics or whatever, you know, he's the man that's got to work that out because he um, he might not be the, the most sort of conniving one out of the three, but he's certainly the one that's got this, you know, the intellect yeah. to try and work it out if he's given time. The problem is the other two don't have the patience, no. you know, and they're trying to get into it with sledgehammers, etc., et you know. And uh, no, it's a good setup, you know. Obviously, the other side of the, the door, um, it's established, obviously, that Sarah uh, suffers epilepsy. Yeah. You know, and this is, it just adds another layer of, you know, problems in this scenario for the, obviously, the, the, the innocent ones in this sort of setup. Um, because obviously, our, um, you know, our medical, you know, needs are not in the room with her. Um, that's actually quite an interesting. It gives uh, Burnham a bit of humanity in the film as well that he's willing to um, come and go with them. Yeah. Because um, I think if it was just him that was going into the, you know, I think it would have been worked out a lot better. He'd have probably been able to reason with, um, you know, the mother and daughter into getting into the room without giving them any harm. It was the other two that sort of kind of cancelled that out because they didn't want witnesses. Certainly the Raoul characters that's no. developed, he's he wouldn't think twice about just. Doing the, doing them in, you know, oh, uh, disposing of the bodies, and I think Burnham knows that as well. So there's an, a, another dimension on the situation there because, as I said, Burnham doesn't trust Raoul. He doesn't trust Junior. He, he thought he did, but obviously when he brought in Raoul, um, all I think all that trust went out the window after that, you know. So yeah, Stephen, these three guys, I, in my mind, I, I always compare it to sort of sticky bandits meets the good, the bad, and the ugly with the conniving and just the idiocy. Yeah. In equal levels. Yeah, good, yeah, there's example, ingenuity, yeah. but there's also idiocy. Yeah. <clears throat> and you see that and when they are flushing the gas in, obviously the ingenuity of Burnham to work out that look, there's a whole hollow part of the wall. This is the grill where the air flows coming in and out. I'll flood the gas in, that'll force them out. We don't want to kill them or do any harm, but then Raul has other things in his mind. Crank it up, get more gas in, get them out quicker. But that all backfires. And to be fair to Junior, I think at the start he is quite happy to come and go. If they allow him in, I think he would yeah. allow them out. He's yeah. just really caring about the money. He doesn't want to kill anyone. Yeah. It's just quick in and out and be done. I think it's really Raul who's the real bad egg in this yeah. threesome, if you like, for lack of a better word. Yeah. What a terrible threesome that would be, man. <laughs> wow. But obviously it does backfire. You see the idiocy because Jodie Foster's character, obviously Meg, has... Yeah. A, a, another degree of ingenuity as well she discovers that look we have a little fire starter thing in here so let's kick that back down into the grill and Stephen not just that even the, the technical stuff seeing the gas coming through it was really yeah. well shot Yeah. and just the little zooms you, into the, the cement mortar yeah, mixture you, coming you, off the wall you Incredible. felt like you were in there with them because of those shots yeah. John you're right you're absolutely right they actually tried to tape up the vents didn't they at one yeah. point but it was coming through at such a force they couldn't pin it down and uh, conveniently, there was a fire blanket in there. There had to be Two. because, um, yeah. Oh, one. Um, because oh, one. obviously, uh, it, was, um, it wasn't matches, wasn't it? It was, it was like a, a fire starter. Like, yeah. Like a, an igniter. Yeah, 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 an igniter. Yeah, yeah. 
It's a <laughs> great scene though. It's <laughs> a funny scene. This is why I thought of Sticky Bandits yeah. because obviously they go through just a whole degree of punishment. <laughs> yeah. And it's poor old Junior who cops it. He gets his sort of two, early 2000s real Ferdinand Conroe hairdo melted into the side of his face he, that, yeah. he hears the sound in the room and he's like what is that he yeah. puts his head up against it she gets it to ignite yeah. I think Burnham's saying we have to get the gas off here guys yeah. come on it explodes the, the, it's just an absolute inferno in the room and outside but they're protected by the blankets this yeah. gas canister's bouncing all over the place up yeah. into the ceiling and whatnot. Yeah. His face is burnt to hell. Yeah, Junior That's becomes the niceness gone. Dent, yeah. 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 <laughs> yes and he does he's a real two face and also the niceness and Maybe a willingness to work with them in the room. It goes after that. He's just out for vengeance to a degree. Because you see it early on in the movie. He's putting screens up or like paper up. Like, yeah. We need what's in the room. If you work with us, then we'll not hurt you and whatnot. Yeah. But that goes. It's just like... It was a shithead. Yeah, I mean, it, also, a shithead. It, it spirals, John. It, you know, it's a situation that could have been, in hindsight, sorted out a lot better. You know? Because I don't think Meg and Sarah were really caring what was in that panic room, no. to be honest with you. I think not worrying about money. No, certainly not, you know. Um, but, you know, it just I think the, the sort of gas thing, you know, the, the you know that scenario, um, there was no going back after that. Because um, Junior obviously changed after that, didn't he? Yeah. You know, he wasn't the sort of happy-go-lucky guy he was at the start of the film. Um, he was... Not as nasty as Raul, but he certainly was a bit more pissed off with, you know, Megan Sarah. Yeah. Stephen, obviously, round about this point as well, they discover there is a, a vent in the room. They start signalling furiously to the neighbour across the road. Fat shit, lying in his bed, lazy. Well, it's four in the morning, to be fair. That's not lazy. <laughs> I take it back. <laughs> That's just for, for night owls like me, Hawks. Yeah. He boards up his room. Why the hell did they stop signalling to him? Yeah. Incidentally, they start shouting help. He's not going to hear. You. He's in a house. Yeah. So they stop, and that just that screws up one possible escape out of this. I think it's established later on. The neighbour does phone the police though. Or he makes some reference to the police officer when he comes. So to be fair, he's not all bad. Uh, and obviously, at this point, you've got Raoul trying to negotiate a, a sizable share of this bounty in this panic room yeah. he's having a conversation with Junior at this point why the hell did, uh, uh, th- this is something that annoys me about this movie it happens twice in the movie before the sort of switcheroo with the husband later on the three guys keep going down the stairs yeah. knowing that they're in the room and they've got, well they didn't know they had surveillance to be fair but they keep going down the room and giving them the opportunity or down the stairs and giving them the opportunity to come out and I'm like, why are they doing it? I know. What are they doing? Idiots. Yeah. There's some inconsistencies that help, also the movie. You need some artistic licence yeah. to help the movie flow tonally. You, you, maybe. you need uh, Meg and Sarah to get out at some point. Obviously, yeah. the mobile phone was one of them, wasn't yeah. it? It was under the bed. Out, yeah. But I think the way that the bed was turned upside down or whatever it was, it was up, put on its side. The phone was moved about. So yeah. I did that tension. I tried to get it, you know, and... Um, and the light um, falls over. Yeah, and that obviously that builds the tension, doesn't it? You it's know, a great like, shot, Stephen. It was in slow motion. Yeah. And you see the three guys on the staircase arguing, and then they hear the sound and they yeah. turn and start running. Yeah. And again, it's like echoing of the start when they're trying to get into the room. Yeah. This race against time. It's just amazingly shot, this movie in points. Technically, with camera wizardry and just slow motion shots. Yeah. Just incredible on a technical level, this movie. I don't know if it get nominated for any awards or whatnot. I'm not sure, for, John editing their technical stuff but probably should have um, obviously she does get back in the room with the phone you're absolutely right Stephen and then obviously uh, completely useless but she yeah. uh, formulates some plan in her brain that she can rewire the, the phone in the room to the main line which she had switched on and it's again you see the the rustling of the wire getting pulled through they're panicking another race against time they're trying to get down the stairs Burnham's trying to use his intellect to cut the line She's phoning up the husband. We get a great scene. I actually didn't realise it was Nicole Kidman until you told me from your yeah. review that it's her voice that's playing the wife of the obviously well not the wife the partner the estranged of her estranged husband, and she tells her, "Look, bitch, put my put my, put him on. Essentially, put Stephen on. Whatever yeah. the hell his name is." That was a great scene as well. The rush against time. They're going down. They're trying to cut it. She's frantically trying to re... It's the quickest rewiring of a phone ever. <laughs> she doesn't even have previous experience and she manages to do it. Yeah. Bit of a Mary Sue, yeah. 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 Just even <laughs> not getting it that again. We'll not start making... Co- I'm wearing a Star Wars hat, but we'll not speak about Star Wars tonight. Jesus Christ, man. We've got enough to speak about. But yeah, I mean, again, I, pivotal, pivotal for this movie, if I can speak 
going into the later stages because it does allow the police to turn up, the husband to turn up, and that adds a certain layer to the movie as well because we have more bodies in this house. At some point or another, I don't know <clears throat> when it happens, but it certainly does happen. I think it's round about when the husband comes in. Yeah. Gets beat to the shit. Oh, he beat, does, doesn't he? Yeah. The shit yeah. gets beat right out of him. I think Junior at this point as well is revealed to be a relation of the dead millionaire who previously occupied the house. That's why he knows about this money being in the safe house. That's why they're all there. Yeah. And then also he, I'm done. I've got my share of the money anyway. I'll phone up and make an anonymous call. I'll get my cut. I'm buggering off out. Raul is revealed to be the absolute shithead that he is. He yes, really is the yeah. bad yeah. egg in the bunch. He yeah. shoots him, doesn't care, careless really. Not happy with shooting him once, he shoots him again in the head. Yeah, yeah. And then also they're using the husband as a sort of emotional baggage to try and draw them out of the room. What was your thoughts on Junior's death, his reveal of having a connection to the ex-owner? And just his bitch death, yeah, I've said. It's funny, John, because when you look at the relationships between the three of them, you naturally assume that it's going to be Raul, uh, you know, and uh, Burnham that are going to have the confrontation. Yeah. You know, are, are going. To, one of them's going to go. You know, you didn't. You, you wouldn't have thought in a million years it would have been Junior uh, and Raul come to that sort of point in their relationship. Um, I actually forgot that. <laughs> I actually forgot that uh, Junior died in this film because I've not seen it for two years but I do remember he, he shot him again after he was already dead um, but the other thing that stood out to me was how old um, Meg's husband was I was like he is too old for he you he's ancient you know it's, I didn't see her as a gold digger I've got to be honest with you <laughs> <laughs> he's a sugar daddy yeah. for sure yeah it was very strange Stephen he was he was a walking corpse essentially that guy's got to be dead now he has to be man the hair he's just ancient and he was useless as well the worst shot I says it later on in the notes when he has the, the gun tied to his hand he's got a worst shot than a stormtrooper yeah, he misses terrible. every single time yeah, that, was, that was really bad <laughs> it's an absolute joke but he obviously gets the shit beat out of him he's got a broken arm and whatnot. so I'll try not to be too harsh yeah. on him and at this point she does come out of the room again I think they lay they, they pretend it's her husband who's lying on the, the bed in the room she sees him slumped over sees them going down the stair again but it's revealed when she sneaks out to try and get the medicine for her daughter that it is Raul dressed in his gear Yeah. and also Stephen at this point as you did say earlier as well Raul gets his hand caught in the door uh, which is fantastic for me because yeah. he's just he's, come up, yeah. he's playing the bravado hard man throughout the movie pointing his gun in Burnham's face when I have one of these people do what I tell them and what not and then he's squealing like a little bitch and Burnham's like what's going on here what what and he's like playing up in it big time she's got your gun but he's also loving it as well that this oh, bitch yeah, has got yeah. his comeuppance and you do you see the humanity of that character she managed this, manages to slide the medicine into the room she speaks back and forth through the intercom and you see he's not like the others he helps the daughter out he speaks to the daughter he tries to calm her down he's yeah. a good guy yeah. he's just been caught up in a terrible circumstance yeah. he didn't want to be in a situation like this where there is people in the house and perhaps there's yeah. going to be casualties yeah, there, he thought well, it was there, empty there was wasn't there in junior yeah. you know yeah. but um, you're right the guy who was so keen to get into the house yeah. and get the money yes. bails and dies uh, he, he, you're right John I think that's the, the message throughout the film though that he's just a, a guy that's failing hard times you know and I'm yeah. not saying that that's the that's an excuse to do but he, he, he does and, and rob people and, and stuff like that but he doesn't want anyone to come to harm. He didn't ask for this uh, Raul character to be part of the plan. He didn't ask for, obviously, Meg and Sarah to be part of the plan either. So yeah. everything's just... It's just been an unfortunate night for this guy, you know. Um, all he wants is some money, you know. Um, but there's all these obstacles in the way. Obviously, um, the, the the probably one of the standout scenes for me, John. I don't know if you want to move on to this now, but the the police. Yeah. Um, you well, know. also the concept, Stephen, of them flipping it as well briefly before you probably yeah. go into that. I thought it was really unique switching the roles around because obviously they are the victims and they yeah. are preying on them. Well, they end up in the room and she ends up outside the room and she's got the gun. She now assumes control, even though they are yeah. stuck in the room. She knows they need to get out. He's trying to get these bonds out the room, st- st- drilling into the the actual safe and whatnot. That was a unique way of changing well, it, getting into the last that, act. It's that, different. That was the reason, John, when you were asking me about the, the intro. You know, the first five minutes of the film was that you did get the sense, although she, as a, she she's vulnerable, obviously, in what's happened in their relationship, but you can sense that she is quite a, a clever, 
you know, women, yeah. and she's she can be very calculated and very focused when she has to be. Certainly, obviously, the, the instincts kick in for a mother as well to protect her daughter. You can't take you can't rule that out either. But it is it's a total switcheroo, you know. And um, I think the film needed that at this point yeah. because it was getting. A, I'm not going to say stale, John, but, but it, was, it needs close. to change in direction in some way. And I think they did it right. It wasn't unbelievable the way they did it either. It's not like she became Rambo all of a sudden or anything yeah. like that. You know, she just had the sort of upper hand. She was more on the front foot at this point. Um, but that's obviously halted. Obviously, with the, you know the the chap at the door. Um, yeah. It's probably there's another scene that kind of stands out for me because. Um, I don't know, obviously, who was playing the the copper at the door, but gigantic. This, but yeah, he was. Huge. Yeah, yeah. You know, Why and, his shoulders but, and the but there's something, um, you know, the tension in that scene. You know, um, where it's a, it must be a horrible situation to be, to be put in. You know, where you just want to spill your guts to the police and tell them we need help. We're in trouble. But she knows, obviously, if that happens, um, there's going to be consequences with her yeah. family members. Um, but the scene just kind of lingers on and it's because of the I sounded like Ringo there when I said that Who's wrong, wrong you know yes. uh, um, but there's, um, there's something about that um, that scene um, and it's, it's due to the policeman not accepting what she's saying you know Paul Schultz is the guy's name Stephen he's yeah. been in the likes of The Punisher and whatnot. he's been in a few movies um, he, he was yeah he just knew there was a sort of I don't want to say peripheral, that's the wrong peripheral, I can't even speak tonight, that is the wrong choice of word, but you just knew there was something going on, <laughs> he had a sixth sense that there was something going on in this house, I think he says to her, look if there's something going on and you can't speak and you can't blink your eyes, and she's like, no, 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 look I've just had a few drinks, I called my husband, yep. uh, I says, look I think three things, uh, I think you asked her, what was the three things, because obviously she says there's three and then it gets cut yeah. off the actual phone. That's right. I think she says something like, three things that I'll do if you come over and sleep with me or something along those lines. She's trying her best to get them away. It's not happening. But as it it's a beautiful scene because you've got that sort of cinematic rain as well happening outside <laughs> yeah. that you only get in a movie. But it's realistic because it is New York. It's on yeah. the Atlantic. But it, yeah, again, it's important because it obviously it shows that even though she has flipped things around, she's got a semblance of control they do still have a daughter in this room. Yep. And in a way, it balances it out a little bit. It keeps a degree of tension in the movie, which could be lost. Because yep. obviously with Raul incapacitated to a degree, his hand's crushed. Yep. You've just got Big Burnham in there and you know he's not going to hurt the daughter. But yeah. if she goes blubbing off to the police, then it could end in tears. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. That was an important scene. I did enjoy it. That was yeah. one of the standout moments in the, the movie. And he is incredibly tall, that cop. I don't know how tall he is, but <laughs> I got the vibes. That he, unless Jodie Foster's teeny, that he was about six foot seven or something. Absolutely massive. But also, Stephen, that does bring us into the finale. She's walking away frantically with the police now away. Yeah. The husband, she tapes him up to the door. She's speaking to him. She seems to have forgave him very quickly, incidentally. Yeah. Uh, it's clearly getting beat to within an inch of your life does something. Uh, but she's taking the gun to his hand as I did say when they come out later on she's a shit shot terrible shot I mean I know you broke your hand but that's no excuse uh, I broke my hand and I could still go out and work there's no excuses <laughs> I'm sorry uh, and obviously just the concept of him coming out he's got the money Burnham Raul's almost like a Terminator in this end of this movie he's getting yeah. hit with sledge hammers I can't speak <laughs> <laughs> he's being hit with sledge hammers falling down fours uh, it's still coming up and continuing to come on and on. Is he's this, choking yeah, her and whatnot. Yeah, is this she's the point he's, that she's try, uh, he's trying to cave her head in with something? I can't remember what it was. It was some sledgehammer, blood. yeah. Was it a sledgehammer, she's yeah. She's stabbed with the yeah. injections by Sarah as well. He's just unstoppable, yeah. this guy. Crushed hand, severe concussion, fell down a flight of <laughs> stairs, and he's <laughs> continuing to go on. Meanwhile, Burnham's disappeared, but he gets a sense of morality and decides, well, look, I'm going to come back. And yeah help this poor family out that we have thrust this terrible situation on he does shoot him in the head uh, what was your thoughts on that finale did you feel like it was anticlimactic or did you think it was just right for this movie it was a bit predictable John it you was know, but you knew Burnham was going to um, save the day at the end of this film you know um, but it, it kind of showed the sort of um, the venomous in this character row didn't it you know um, albeit you know he's, he's an unstoppable force at this point but the the fact that he's, he's he quite might. prepared to you know cave uh, you know Meg's head in with a sledgehammer shows the, the degrees this guy will go to um, but you know it all 
all worked out in the end, I suppose, you know, a few cuts and bruises and bullet holes and stuff like that, but certainly not for Junior, but... Um, <laughs> yes, a bloodshot you know, He probably was treated the worst in this film. He really uh, was, with know. that haircut alone. I mean, <laughs> Stephen Jared let on this movie. Obviously, it's the start of his career at this point. He had done movies prior to this. He was in The Thin Red Line, I want to say, yeah. and a few other movies. I mean, what did you make of his performance? Obviously, he is a bit of a joke in it. He's, yeah. he's like the sticky bandit. He's like, was um, it Marv? Certainly not the Joker. <laughs> not the, he's not the Joker. Well, he is a Joker, right. but not that kind of a um, Joker. Yeah. I, Just performances in general. Then I'll get yeah. into that really on-the-nose scene at the end with Burnham. Put your hands up and show your hands. Let's yeah. give all the $22 million worth of bonds away. Let's yeah. let it swirl round in the air. Yeah. What it's, was your thoughts on performances? The performances, John. Obviously, Jared Leto was um, one of the standouts in this film. Yeah, you know, he's, he's, a, he's, he's a terrific actor. You know, we can switch from just an absolute raving loony to you know a serious character it is amazing. You know, um, Forrest Whitaker is always good in whatever he's in. You know, he, he never really. Save the dream. He never. He, he, he doesn't really up the ante in his sort of enthusiasm. He's always take it or leave it type of guy but um, you know Jodie Foster she was going through um, this period you know just after obviously she did Contact in the late 90s yeah. um, I, I, so I want to say maybe the early 2000s right up you know you had films like um, This Flight Plan um, another good one Sean yeah, well, it was a great film John you know um, well I don't it was a good film I'll not go that far um, you know there was a, just this um this period in her career um, like, was like a second win. She did, obviously, um, uh, The Brave One as well, which came out later in the, t- the 2000s. And they were decent films, you know. I just think that she had this period where um, she was just... Um, yeah, Anne and the King was the other one, you know, I think just at the end of the 90s. In the midst um, of a renaissance. I think yeah. so. That's the best way to put it, John. You know, and uh, this film, um, I think... If, you know, this is a Jodie Foster film. Let's not forget that. You know, she carries a film from start to finish. She plays a very strong, powerful character, and um, yeah, I, I would say that probably Jodie Foster is a standout performer in this. But you know, Jared Leto. Um, I think this is probably the first film I saw him in, and I just, I just remember him for his performance. You know, he was. He was good. He was also a bit of a impatient man child at times but it was a standout performance he's certainly one of the yeah. he's probably the standout of the, the trio of baddies even though Forrest Whitaker's fantastic he's Burnham he's the sort of morality of the bad guys he's probably get the most screen time of them but the yeah. standout performer the guy that catches your eye it's not Raul for that haircut No, it's definitely Jared Leto something about the guy he has that charisma yeah. even in this movie that captures your attention whilst you're watching it. Christian Stewart as well, very young. Yeah. Just a pain in the ass in this movie, really. It was a good performance, but we never touched yeah. upon that. She was a yeah. complete liability. Yeah, she's the emotional baggage, liability. John. You know, and that's I mean she would go on to do obviously bigger things, but uh, Dwight Yoakam was obviously the guy who played Ryo. If you, if you didn't know, you know. Yes. Well we might as well mention him, John, because yeah, he was, was a big part of the film, you know, yeah. I think um <laughs> the whole um mysterious nature of this character at the very start of the film was quite laughable I felt you know it was it was a bit daft you know that I didn't really see the point of it um, it was, it was a bit, so uh, obvious it was, was a bit campy and, and, and it was a total yeah. difference from the character you know from the start of the film to what we saw at the end of the film you're thinking he seems the type of guy that would find someone putting a, a mask on ridiculous if you know what I mean yeah. the guy that we see at the end yeah Steve I think it's just to reveal well, you think these two guys are in control of the situation? He's just some gimp that Junior's brought along for the ride. Maybe a getaway driver or something. I think he was a taxi driver, or yeah. at least he gave that impression to Junior. Yeah. I think he just utilised him for that big reveal. Maybe at the time it was shocking when he shot shot him in the head. Yeah. For me, it wasn't really that shocking. Watching it again, it was like, mm, yeah, I expected it. You're treating him like a fool. You're slagging him, insulting him. Yeah. He's going to break. He's just going to shoot you. The guy is silent. It's the silent ones you have to watch out for, they always so they say. say yeah. Not the loud mouths, you go for the silent one and put the fist on them first and then the rest all collapse like a house of cards. So I'm told, <laughs> Stephen, obviously, uh, just technical wizardry in this movie. The way the movie's wrote as a whole, if that's even the correct word, yeah. uh, Fincher's just fantastic, he really is. Yeah. You hit the nail on the head though, we'll probably combine this with final thoughts because we don't want to overstay, we're well welcome. No. Let's be honest. 
It's not his best movie, not by a no. mile. Seven and Fight Club for me are still the two best movies from Fincher. But there's something yeah. about the guy. He's got a unique style. Yeah, he's a really great director. Something just the way he balances the technical aspects. He's got a uniqueness about his movies. When you watch it, you know it's a Fincher movie. But at the same time, no two films are the same. No, you know that's the sort of genius of the man. But you're right, John. Um, he, he tried things in this film that. I hadn't seen before. I don't know if that technology existed before this film so. or not. It was it was almost like keyhole surgery cameras, you know, winding it up and down the the floors through the cracks in the the walls and stuff like that. And it was it was good to a degree. I, I'm glad they never it never overstayed its welcome. I think just sort of it was kind of bordering on annoying, you know. And they, they moved away from it after that. Yeah. Um, the tone as well, just with the, the colour palette, you know, but like we mentioned, I mentioned it in my review as well, just those sort of uh, sombre tones, you know, to, to give the, the film that eeriness. Um, some of the shots as well that I mentioned, that rotating one, you know, with uh, obviously Forrest Whitaker's silhouette in the background where whilst, you know, Jodie Foster slept was quite creepy, I felt. Um, but there's something about films that are sort of contained in a, a you know, a, a a, a very small space. You, you get the likes of like Snowpiercer. Yeah. Um. It's very similar in that sense where there's only so much you can do. So let's make the most of it. And they do in this film. You know. Um. Obviously the cinematography in this film was excellent. Really um, good. And I think it was excellent as well, considering you know it was all primarily based in a townhouse in New York. Yeah, Stephen. Look. Yeah, the cinematographers. There was actually two. Really renowned cinematographers, Conrad W. Hall and also Darius Conji. They've worked in a whole array of movies with Fincher previously, the likes of Seven. Yeah. Uh, they have worked on just Punisher. That's a shite movie. That's a terrible thing to even bring up. That's not the Punisher I'm thinking of. No. But Sleepy Hall, Fight Club, American Beauty, the list is endless, yeah. man. These guys know what they're doing. And you get that sense they've worked in conjunction with Cope. Uh, not Cope, Fincher. I'll get into Cope for a minute. Yeah. And given as a real visual spectacle yeah. in this movie, they, I liked the score as well. I thought the score was pretty damn good. Uh, it was obviously Howard Shaw. He's worked in Lights of the Hobbit and whatnot. Also, that intro when the burglars come in, it's just tenseful and there's a lot of building of. I don't know. I don't want to say tension again because I've already said tension, but I can't think of any other word. Yeah. So that is just down to the score as well and the cinematography. Suspenseful. Suspenseful is yeah. the word I'm with. Suspenseful, not suspenseful. <laughs> um, I'm having a well. We're going to end this shortly. So on a technical level, this movie is fantastic. On a written level, David Cope, you obviously mentioned him in your review as well, Stephen. He's a great writer. He yeah. is a fantastic yeah. writer. Jurassic Park, Star of Echo, Spider-Man, Mission Impossible. Absolutely fantastic writer. He's renowned, although I don't know what happened in the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull and Zavura and stuff like that. Yeah, George Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> he went down a rabbit It's, it's interesting you should say that, John. I didn't know he did Stir of Echoes, you know. And yes. It's another film, it's very similar to, you know, in its sort of quality of um, Panic Room where, um, you know, you've got the big name stars in there, but for some reason it just doesn't hit the peaks. I don't know what it is. It's an, you know, it's an enjoyable experience. And I've watched Panic Room several times because it has a kind of rewatchability about it. Even though it's not a great Fincher film, same with Star of Echoes as well. The amount of times I've watched that, and there's something about it. I don't know what it is. I think it's just the writing that really draws me it's in. Kevin Bacon. You know, and Kevin Bacon's in it as well. Yeah, you always love Kevin Bacon, unless you're a certain individual that we know who absolutely hates him and thinks he's a paedophile. But Stephen, obviously, I'll, I'll wrap it up by saying you're right. What he says about this concept of keeping it in an enclosed space. I love movies like that as well, as you did say. The Hush was the other one that's recently sprung to mind. Green Room, I yeah. keep mentioning these. Almost siege horror in a way, but it isn't horror. It's crime drama thriller, obviously, because it says that in IMDb. But it did have siege elements to it, for yeah. lack of a better word. So I really enjoyed this movie, <laughs> in a sense. I love Fincher. I actually rented this movie at half two last night to watch it, so I think that'll tell you my <laughs> enthusiasm of this movie and giving it a good review. Stephen, I'm done. I'm not going to say any more. I'm ready to go down an Anthony Daniels rabbit hole, so I'm going to round it up on that note, unless you have anything else to add to it. No, I don't. Well, that's going to round up our review of Panic Room. What is your thoughts on this movie? Do you think it's suspenseful as well? <laughs> what is your thoughts on a whole array of things going on in it? Did you hate it? Love it? Were you merely ambivalent towards it? If you've got anything to say at all, you can comment below in the comments section. You can also like the video if you've enjoyed it. And you can subscribe to the channel if you want to see more 
content like this I'm getting gravelly <laughs> and if you do then you'll see us again on Monday for another movie review.